Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to your last week of classes here at Jesuit High School. It's a strange feeling, I have no doubt, and it's been a strange quarter in general. But I have every confidence that we're going to make it a good one and that we will finish as well as possible. Up to now, we've been discussing religious life and consecrated life and the history of religious life, how it began with people taking vows of virginity, and that once the persecutions ended, once there were no longer martyrs, people were looking around and thinking, how is it that we can offer ourselves fully? How can we embody in the fullest way possible the life of Christ? This is why people really looked to the martyrs and why martyrs were really seen as the highest form of Christians, because martyrs embodied the life and embodied the death of Christ in the fullest way possible, down to the core, the most physical sense of their being. So then we have people saying, I'm going to take vows. I'm going to go out into the desert. We're going to live in monasteries. We're going to take on rules of life that are going to impact every last element of how we live. And from there, from the monasteries, then you have the mendicant orders. Then you have the, monast uh, the, uh, the active orders. Then you have the congregation. And that brings us more or less up to the present day. But then with all of this history, there can still perhaps be the lingering question in the back of your minds, so what? What is the benefit? What is the impact that all of this still has on the church? And what's the benefit that all of this has on me? Truth be told, the fact of the matter is, after, as with priesthood, I don't particularly expect the majority of you to be called to religious life. And this is a good thing. The world needs, this is part of the lay vocation, the lay vocation is to go out into the world and to sanctify the world, to make the world uh, a holier place and prepare the world for Christ's coming. This is ultimately the vocation of the vast majority of you, and that is a good and holy vocation. Make no mistake about it. So if most of you aren't called to the religious life, then what is the impact of the religious life, of consecrated life, on your own existence and on the church in general? And that is going to be the subject of today's discussion, today's lecture, as we look at religious life in the church today and how it fits into the larger question of our existence as a church in the modern day. One of the most important ways that religious orders can have an impact on lay people are through oblates, through third orders, and through other lay associations. Now, when we talk about oblates and third orders, lay association sounds pretty clear. What is an oblate? What are third orders? Well, let's start with third orders, and then we're going to take a look at oblates. First of all, when we talk about third orders, were there two other orders that we just completely missed out on? Yes. And all of this actually comes from the Franciscans. St. Francis was the first person to really set things up in this way. And from St. Francis, then this became more or less standard practice uh, among other orders to have what was called a third order. So the first order, as you can see here in the diagram, the first order among the Franciscans, this is the order of friars minor. So you have the OFMs, which is the regular Franciscans, the OFM caps, which is the Capuchins, OFM conv, uh, the conventual Franciscans. So there's various types of Franciscans. The male branch of the Franciscans are cumulatively, are collectively known as the first order of the Franciscans. The second order are the poor Clares. So Francis of Assisi and his friend Claire of Assisi. Claire was actually an Augustinian nun. And so there was an Augustinian influence when she decided, I want to live out the Franciscan life. And so Claire helped uh, establish a monastery of Franciscan nuns based on the way of life of Augustinian nuns. And that slowly but surely, the second order of poor Clares became uh, the second order of became the monastic element of the Franciscans, and the poor Clares main mission was really to offer prayers for the entire Franciscan order. Then you have the third order, and that's developed split off into two branches. You have the secular Franciscans and the third order regular. Third order regular are uh, priests and sisters who are. Franciscans, but they aren't nuns necessarily, but they're living maybe a looser association. Uh, Franciscan University in Steubenville is actually run by the third order regular of, uh, of Franciscans. 
Secular Franciscans are lay people. They are lay people who, individuals who love the Franciscan mission, love Francis's spirituality, but they went up to Francis on one occasion and they said, we love being, we love what you're doing, but it's not something that we ourselves can do. Is there a way that we can be associated with the Franciscan mission, kind of like how certain people are associated with the Benedictines, and this is where oblates are going to come in. And St. Francis said, yes, yes, there is. I'm part of the first order. Uh, my dear friend Claire of Assisi is part of the second order, and now we're going to establish a third order. In addition to third order regular for priests and sisters, there's gonna be a third order secular, meaning out there in the world, of individuals who are affiliated with the, the order, but yet not themselves formal members of the order. The Franciscans have it, the Dominicans have it, all of the mendicant orders have it. With the monastic orders, their equivalent is oblates. Oblates are, as with third orders, oblates are people who have gone through a certain uh, formation, certain amount of training, they know the prayers of the order, they know the spirituality, and they've even taken vows. They're they can be married, they can live life out in the world, but those oblates have a particular union to their local Benedictine monastery. They go there for prayer on a regular basis, and they might even be buried out by the, uh, on the monastery grounds due to that close association. Two famous examples of Benedictine oblates are a, uh, a male Benedictine oblate would be Walker Percy, New Orleans' own, and then Dorothy Day, who we've discussed previously. Walker Percy was a Benedictine oblate actually associated with the, uh, the Benedictine Monastery, the Benedictine Abbey up on the North Shore. He was, you know, he was a medical doctor, he was an author, he was a husband, he was a father. He was completely out there in the world, and yet he still, he had a regular practice of prayer that was very Benedictine at heart. He would go to the Benedictine Monastery for retreats, for spiritual direction, for all sorts of things. And this was the heart of his spiritual life. Likewise with Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day spent years doing wonderful things, fighting against the true injustices of the world. When the Great Depression hit, she was there making sure that people got fed. She was there with the labor movement, making sure workers got just treatment. But all of this was nourished and rooted in a sense of community. Dorothy Day's autobiography, which you ever get the chance, I highly recommend reading it. She, her autobiography is The Long Loneliness. And, what, and her experience of the church, what she really appreciated, in addition to the sacraments, in addition to that healing and reconciliation after the many sins of her younger years, was being able to be with others and to speak with Christ, to speak about Christ and to speak about God with other individuals. The various intentional communities, these Catholic worker communities that she established, basically communes of Catholics who wanted to live very poor, very radical and simple lives with her as they took care of the poor, but all of them lay people, was very much based on these Benedictine ideals. And Dorothy Day was, for most of her Catholic life, a Benedictine oblate. And I'm not sure about uh, Dorothy Day, but Walker Percy, I know, he is actually buried on the grounds of uh, of. St. Ben's Abbey up on the North Shore. If you ever want to go and visit his, uh, his grave, that's entirely possible. If you're a member of a third order, very often you will uh, have some part sort of distinctive dress. So you can see here uh, this woman uh, in this image down here below, she is a member of the third order of the Dominicans. And so likewise, there's prayer and there's study and there's spiritual formation. There's regular meetings. You have a particular association with the Dominicans in your area or with the Benedictines or with the Franciscans in your area if you're part of the third order. In her case as well, and in most cases, if you're a member of the third order laity, even as a member of the laity, there is some distinctive garment. So in her case, she wears the white scapular of the Dominicans, and this is common among third order laity, uh, that you will wear on certain occasions, like at special masses, you'll wear the Dominican scapular, or you'll wear the Franciscan scapular, or the Carmelite brown scapular, some kind of distinctive garment in addition to the spiritual and intellectual formation. Or in the case of this gentleman here, he has a Dominican cross that he uh, wears around his neck. 
he, he received this and it's very common for Dominican third order individuals to receive that. And even if it's not a special liturgical occasion, uh, they might have that or maybe a little of help in something of that nature. And as we see here, uh, here's a group of Carmelite third order members and they're wearing a larger version of the Carmelite brown scapular. The devotion to the brown scapular, by the way, originates with the Carmelites. It takes uh, a part of the Carmelite habit and it transforms it into something any of us can wear. I actually wear a brown scapular myself uh, under my own uh, my shirt, or in this case, my Jesuit cassock. Uh, and so the, this is one way in which individuals can receive some of the spiritual benefits, some of the spiritual fruits of being a part uh, of these orders without themselves necessarily making a vow of poverty, making a vow of obedience, making a vow of chastity. And this is also one of the great things as well. These are all various different ways in which y'all can pray. You may have spent the last five years at a Jesuit high school, but there's no rule that says you have to like the Jesuit way of praying. Maybe you're more drawn to Benedictine spirituality. That's great. Carmelite spirituality. Fantastic. Dominican spirituality. Go with God. There are as many orders as there are, as many congregations and, and groups as there are in the church. There's a different form of spirituality. Find one that's right for you. Find a way of prayer that really speaks to you, that really helps you grow in your relationship with God. Maybe it's Jesuit and Ignatian prayer. Maybe it isn't. That's fine. And thankfully, as with Walker Percy, as with Dorothy Day, as if with all of these individuals, you have the whole rest of your lives to figure out, perhaps, am I called to a third order? If so, which one? What's, what kind of prayer as, am I going to take on as I draw deeper and deeper into my relationship with Jesus Christ and so live out my Christian vocation? I do believe we try and talk about that from time to time. Some of the other benefits of religious orders, even if you never join a third order or become a Benedictine oblate or join a lay association, there are retreat houses, as with the Jesuit retreat house in Manresa, or uh, in Convent, Louisiana, Manresa retreat house. And as Jesuits are not the only group that run retreat houses. Most Benedictine monasteries, most monasteries in general, will have a retreat house that, or a retreat wing where lay people can come and they can make prayers with the monks. Franciscans run plenty of retreat houses. Dominicans run plenty of retreat houses, give plenty of retreats. The Passionists love giving retreats, the Redemptorists. Most every order has some kind of a retreat house where people are able to come and experience the spirituality of, uh, of that group. And it can be for just a little day of reflection. It can be as with Manresa, maybe a Thursday through Sunday retreat. It can be something longer. There are, every order has retreat houses where people can experience their kind of prayer. Find out what sort of prayer is right for you and then see, is there an order that has a retreat house that's maybe within driving distance, a couple hours away? This can be something that you can do. And certainly many Jesuit alums have availed themselves of the men's retreats at Manresa, as well as plenty of other forms of retreat houses and Catholic spirituality, benefiting from the great work of these religious orders. There are various works of mercy, both corporal and spiritual. So that, for instance, uh, we see there in, uh, in the longer panel, uh, a Franciscan, he's uh, a reformed version of the Franciscans, the CFRs, the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And that's a Franciscan congregation, interestingly enough, based on the Capuchin order. So it's uh, some a uh, group of Capuchin Franciscans decided we want to live in even more radical form of poverty. And so they founded the CFRs, the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And actually just a few years ago, they got finally got papal approval. So they are now an order of papal right, pontifical right, so that they answer directly to the Pope. The Franciscans live in various places. They live very radical lives of extreme poverty, extreme simplicity, and they themselves work amongst some of the poorest of the poor. So you can see there uh, this Franciscan friar uh, talking with, uh, with this homeless man. And uh, when I was in New York, the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal had a church in Harlem. And I believe this is, uh, this is in that vicinity. And they would just go out to the streets. They had a soup kitchen. They had a homeless shelter. But the Franciscan Friars would also just go out onto the streets and look for people and see, is there a way that I can help you? Is there a way that I can give some assistance to you. 
and really just getting right down there in the dirt, in the grime uh, with the people, bringing Christ and bringing the presence of the church to people who are truly, really suffering. In addition, there are the spiritual works of mercy as well. This, uh, so you see here, this is a Trappist from the Abbey of, uh, in New Melloray in Iowa, New Melloray uh, Abbey. And one of the things that this abbey does, this Trappist abbey does in order to keep itself afloat, is they make caskets. And so you see there a Trappist, uh, Trappist monk making a casket. And as they do, they will say prayers for whoever it is uh, who's supposed to be, who's going to be next using it. One of the spiritual works of mercy, of course, is to pray for the dead. Interestingly enough, they have recently donated a lot of caskets. New Melloray Abbey, at when the coronavirus virus was really beginning to get serious, New Melloray Abbey said, if you cannot afford a casket for your loved ones, let us know. We will make that casket for free. We will send you all of our prayers. We will send you all of our blessings. They wanted to make sure that no one was just thrown into a ditch uh, because their family couldn't afford a casket uh, and that no one went unprayed for. The monks of New Melloray Abbey, the Trappists of New Melloray Abbey, truly are doing the Lord's work in really some very hidden and unseen ways. And that's one of the great things about religious orders in general. A lot of the work that they do is behind the scenes. We never really see some of the great works that they do. But uh, whether it's visiting the homeless people in places that we'd rather just walk a little faster past, whether it is building caskets, making caskets, or even donating caskets to people who can't afford it, and then praying for those individuals, showering so many people in the church with their prayers. Religious orders in so many ways really do make sure that the church is well taken care of. In addition to this prayer for the church, here you see the, uh, the main church, the main community, uh, the Abbey Chapel for New Melloray Abbey. And I show you this, a friend of mine was a member of, he was a novice at the New Melloray Abbey for a little while. Uh, eventually, so when you're a novice, you can decide whether or not you want to stay in forever. You haven't yet taken your vows. It's sort of like when you're a novice, you're basically like dating God. Then after the end of New Year Novitiate, you take vows and y'all are good and hitched. My friend was a novice and then he decided, he realized that it wasn't for him for various reasons. And one of the things that he told me that really struck me, so at, at night prayer, so I've mentioned before the prayers that monks will say throughout the day, the liturgy of the hours, and which is also all priests and all religious are obliged to say the liturgy of the hours. Night prayer, compline, is a prayer that is said in the evening, usually shortly before one goes to bed. The monks of New Melloray Abbey, when they offer compline, they will usually offer it at around eight at night or so, and they will deliberately offer it for those who are sick, for those who are dying, for those who cannot sleep, and for those who have no one else to pray for. them. So if you've ever had a restless night, you're trying to get to bed, and you just, you're tossing, you're turning, nothing you do is working to help get you asleep, congratulations. You have been prayed for by the monks of New Melloray Abbey, who pray every night for those who are having difficulty sleeping, as well as for those who are dying this evening, and for those who have no one else to pray for them. And if you've ever thought there is no one else who I have to pray for me, congratulations. The monks of New Melloray Abbey have prayed for you. And the same is true for so many abbeys, so many monasteries, so many convents, so many cloisters, so many monks and nuns and friars and sisters. Many people in the church, many more people in the church are praying for you than you have ever realized. So the next time you find yourself having trouble falling asleep, Say a prayer to God and say a prayer in thanksgiving for the monks of New Melloray Abbey, individuals who have prayed for you and prayed for so many people throughout the world, even though they never were aware of it. The church truly is sustained by individuals like this who are praying for us, even though no, most people would never know and most people are never aware enough to say thank you. And yet they keep on praying for us. They keep exercising these works of mercy. They keep exercising this prayer for the church. They keep making their spirituality. They keep making themselves available for the whole rest of the church to benefit for the fruits of that. And these are some of the really wonderful ways in which religious life and religious orders and consecrated life still remains a tremendous, absolutely wonderful blessing for the church today.
So that's what religious life can do for you. It can provide you with a way of prayer, even if you aren't interested in becoming a monk or a, uh, or a brother or a priest of a religious order. There are still many ways in which these orders can provide uh, ways of prayer for you. Perhaps you're the next Walker Percy who's going to become a great Benedictine oblate and become a medical doctor or write great novels. Percy did both. You can just pick one or the other and that'll still be good enough in your own life. Perhaps uh, you might become a Franciscan, uh, third order Franciscan, third order Dominican. Or perhaps you just want to make use of the Jesuit retreat house in convent. You want to go to Manresa and join the long heritage of the individuals who have made use. Of, uh, of this retreat house and explored Jesuit spirituality in greater depth. Perhaps there's another religious order out there that has its own lay association, that has its own way of prayer that we haven't yet covered, but that you want to explore, that you want to be nourished by. Find some way. All of these saints, that's a great thing. All of these saints who founded these orders, the orders kind of take on the personalities of their founders. Find the saint whose personality really matches with your own. And then say, let me see if I can find out more about the spirituality of that order and become associated in some way as a layperson with that order. And even if you don't do that, know that the religious orders, the con members of consecrated life, we do continue to pray for you, all of you, on a regular basis, basis on a daily basis. As I said before, I offer my masses, I offer the liturgy of the hours for y'all uh, very regularly. Uh, this past month, this past quarter, I have kept you all in prayer on a regular basis very, very frequently, I can assure you that. Many religious orders do the same for the people that they know and for the people that they've never met. And this is the grace of religious life. This is the blessing that religious life is for the church. This actually c concludes the last of the new material we are going to have for this quarter. Tomorrow, we're going to do a little bit of review. And then I'll say a few things that will sort of wrap all, the whole semester up. And then I will have a, a personal announcement that I'm going to make about, uh, about my own self uh, and at the very end of tomorrow's video. So uh, with Wednesday being a day for open question and answer before the test on Thursday. So with that, gentlemen, have a good day and be assured of the prayers of so many people for you who are in religious life, know that we are constantly praying for you and rest in that comfort.